Yeah, yeah, man. What's up, guys and dolls, dudes and dudettes? Um, let's say xenomorphs and coneheads. This is Talking with Burritos, the podcast that's giving you something to talk about when you need to talk about aliens. Yes, previously on the Potterito, we've had what? Uh, we talked about the makings of the creature feature. That two hours in the afternoon or the late, you know, evenings during the 80s when networks broadcasted films that spanned from like the 19, what, 30s to the 1960s. With, they included monsters, aliens, and these larger than life creatures that fed on our imaginations, our fears, and excitement for the unknown. In episode 76, we focused on Kong, Skull Island, that movie, because I was taking more, thinking more about the human element and taking the human element out of the creature feature in an effort to learn more about the creature and its existence. Think about like Kong ever wanting a female Kong. How would he feel about that? How could you express that emotionally, emotionally within a big old monstrous ape-like creature? Because if you think about the apes, you know, they have human tendencies you know human-like tendencies humanistic tendencies that really relate to us and how our emotions are our emotions and the way we feel and all that we've seen that in monkey tribes and people you know in the gatherings in their communities so i'm thinking about that godzilla did he i mean i'm not godzilla but the king kong did he ever want a female kong and maybe that was his weird attraction towards this blonde lady but you would think that he would want somebody a little bit more like his own self instead of some little six not not even six foot five foot nothing um blonde woman from new york also what about kong, um, godzilla and his little baby kong how did he have baby kong who laid that egg to hatch baby kong you know that weird ugly misshapen face little thing because if that little baby kong that's what little kongs look like that little thing was ugly i don't know what his name was but Godzilla jr i mean not kongzilla but godzilla jr i don't know what his name was he just looked very creepy i hated that damn thing in those two episodes that's what we talked about just talking about taking the human element out of these films a little bit and concentrate more on their existence their environment to really immerse us into it and it's not and then i guess i'm not proposing that we take them out completely but leaving in a certain aspects of them, you know, not making it all about them. Like in Kong and in the previous Kong and some of the other Kong movies, it was more about the people going to the island and finding Kong rather than us dwelling to Kong's universe and these monstrous creatures and basically him fearing for his life and or fearing for mankind or these monsters that might be unleashed unto mankind. So, I don't know. I think I thought that would be something to investigate. And in episode 77, we dwelled into the dark universal with the mummy circa Tom Cruise. And although this movie performed horribly at the box office and everywhere else it showed, I don't think it will kill the franchise. What they need, and that's universal, is to introduce the more obscure tales from this universe and not... Focus on the popular names such as Dracula, Mummy, or Werewolf. Okay, so now for this third installment, like I said before, we're going to take a talk about aliens because they were neither it they ne neither fit in the category of monster or creature, but they fall into that unknown slot. We don't fear them as much as we are intrigued by them. So if they gave us a reason to be afraid, well, I'm pretty sure we'll piss our pants. Until that time comes, our curiosity will preen within the, the space of our minds. That's what we're going to be talking about in this episode of Talking with Burritos. For starters, we're going to talk about a movie that came out last year. It's called Phoenix Forgotten. Now, a lot of people probably dismissed this movie. Probably didn't want to see it. But because, you know, it's, follow, it's just... Once, because a lot of people thought, hey, this looks like Blair Witch. And it kind of did. But unlike this popular comparison to the Blair Witch Project, Phoenix Forgotten, you know, it navigates its way through this story using both found footage and documentary style interview segments 
in a concerted effort to establish a distinct record of events leading up to the night that three teens went missing from an Arizona desert. At most, there was about 30 minutes worth of wandering around and getting spooked by random noises in the dark, which wasn't more or less as entertaining as the Blair Witch, but the trio, they lose their way in the woods and you can only do so much with that. Phoenix for- Forgotten, it approached this whole storytelling differently. It tells the story of these teens' disappearance, right? They reveal their plight, which works which work to present the kids as people rather than characters within a movie. I enjoyed The Blair Witch, but the payoff was more memorable than the build-up in that movie. In this instance, The Fiend is Forgotten, you know, the filmmakers were able to capture more of the intrigue surrounding the circumscribed events. I was on the edge of my seat towards the end, the anticipation for the moment when these kids found what they set out for. And so it's so kind of like, you know, be careful what you wish for. They went out to look for this thing and then you find it. And then next thing you know, you're scared shitless. This complete dumbfounded circumstances by which, you know, the discovery was made. You know, similar to the Blair Witch, there was this creepy old house in the middle of nowhere. And there, lurking in the dark corner within, with his back towards me, was a, was a figure who I thought was my friend. But no, eh, we pretty much think it was an alien. So the final scene of this docudrama, which... I would dare say, I I wouldn't say it was a horror, just like a lot of these creature features. A lot of them I don't say are horror movies because I think that's an entire category on its in its own. And, you know, we I talked about that in, I think, the first movie. I talked about, about that in other episodes. I'm pretty sure I did. This movie, it introduced a theory seldom used in films about Alien. And this really intrigued me. That's why I wanted to really tackle this episode. It's like aliens in their relation to the Bible. And so you can sneer. You can start sneering right right now. So if you believe or you don't believe, I'm not going to get all into like all the aspects of like, you should believe this. I'm not going to preach to you. I'm just going to state what is actually fact, what's been stated here, what's been stated there. And regards to, in regards to the alien phenomenon. So bear with me. So if you are Bible literate and are familiar with the book of Ezekiel, then you know about Ezekiel's will. And again, it's all in how you interpret words. Some might say that Ezekiel depicted, I'm not going to depict it. I'm not going to say, I, 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 for some reason I wrote down right here, kind of city voice. Some might say what Ezekiel depicted within that section of the Bible was misinterpret it was a misinterpretation of a vision set forth upon him by our God the Lord. Okay. So while others read it differently, much like the events of March thirteenth and sixteenth of what, nineteen seventy seven? You know, the Phoenix Forgotten, the Phoenix Lights, that they call them Phoenix Lights. It's all in how you interpret what you saw and that eventually may will define what you believe we may never see aliens because they've already been here you never fall down this rabbit hole please i mean seriously after doing research on this topic i found all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories and sites that are quite frightening from the pyramids of egypt to the stargazing mayans and soothsaying aztecs We have long suspected that aliens have already visited this planet. But what if, so what if the case is that they they did visit this planet? What if they are our creators? Do you think we messed up? That we may have messed up something along the way? And that our creators are looking down upon us like, eh, we could go back there. Or some guys, some well, you have two guys in a ship or something. They're like, you know what? We could go back down there. And the other guy's like, oh, we could just press a button and destroy them all. Kind of like Prometheus where we were, where they discovered they went to go search for the meaning of life on this alien planet. And they get very close for, you know, the xenomorph starts killing the entirety of them. But you have this idea you know, towards the end of this film that she was in search for the creators. She found that the creators are creators and she eventually in turn went to go search for them. She followed their ship 
off of the planet to go search for them. And then we go into Alien Covenant, which came out this year as well, which was kind of like a disappointment because if you're in search for the meaning of life, you know, they left us there. They left us that little caveat. They left us that dangling fruit, fruit, where we were just like, um, wow, they're going to really go there. We're going to see these people. We're going to see our creators in within the realm of this movie. We're going to see our creators. We're going to see... And they're going to explain to us why they wanted to destroy us. Why did they want to destroy humankind? That is, they came to Earth. They created us. They helped create us. They, we became this like big science experiment to them. What if that's the case? And so they go in. We come in the second movie, and these uh, these other space explorers come in. They want to investigate. Like they're searching the planets. What are they searching for? I totally forgot. They're searching for something. But we have someone else. Another mission ongoing mission to search for life somewhere out there where humans can inhabit i don't know but then they find it they find life on this distant planet and they find figure out that like oh this is where the woman from the other previous movie crashed and landed and hey she should be here oh look there's some existing things there should be another alien race here oh wait and then we find out that they're all dead. Spoiler alert. So that you know, that's not going to really ruin the movie for you. There's much more to it. A lot more xenomorphs. A lot more of, what's that guy's name? Totally forgot him. But whatever. He plays Magneto. That's all I'm saying. I can't even think of his name right now. But we have him. You have a lot of that. So you have a lot more movie to look forward to. And let's get into a review of that movie. Just let's touch on it a little bit. Because I never spoke about that movie. But I enjoyed pretty much enjoyed what they were trying to do but i think really scott he's in in in, he's confused about what he wants to do with that feature because he the first movie he tried to go very philosophical with you with us and give us like this meaning this ultimate meaning to the xenomorph and to the idea of the life beyond the realms of uh, the earth you know life into the in the stars so he tried to give meaning and life to the xenomorph into this alien franchise something a little bit more to juicier to, to to just chew into but then we went south with it because a lot of people are like oh prometheus was so boring like what are those blue creatures and why however you put it with this film where this one he said he wanted to include the same thing. You had a Michael Fassbender is his name. Okay, you have Michael Fassbender, Fassbender just preaching all kinds of philosophy. But then you also have Xenomorphs and you have the action stuff. And the problem is with this now that the action was weaker. You had more of it, but it was weaker in this movie than it would have been in the first movie. In this one, we wanted more of the philosophical because he set us up to explain why these people wanted to destroy the human race. But then we got Michael Fassbender saying all these crazy things about life and creation and him being an android and us. And that's a whole nother story. And that's going to be next week. Or that's going to be the next episode when I talk about Blade Runner, when I talk about us creating sentient, sentient life and how, if possible, if we do, if we're ever successful to the point where we're, where it's life makes a way to create itself within a computer. What? We're going to be all messed up. So we go there next week because, you know, if you guys know me, I like going into these things. I like ah, researching and delving into it because I subscribe to Wired Magazine and I'm crazy. I don't know. We had the Aliens Covenant, and which was a good film, though. It was still a good film. However, you know, it just lacked some things. Michael Fassbender was ace. In this movie, a little much better than Assassin's Creed. He was an ace in, in Snowman. Oh man, he did have some duds, right? He had some duds. I think Assassin's Creed was a week of the year before, but still, it was, the last two films or so didn't even X Men: Days of Future Past. That was weird too. He was all weird in that one. But okay, so we have this, and so we're going off to the subject here. So aliens covenant. So we have aliens, and we have our creators, and they've come back to Earth to try to destroy us. And the question is, if we were created by aliens, what and why? What would bring them back here to Earth? You know, if we had these visitations from Venus, forgotten those lights that that have never been disproven 
to be anything but aliens or something or an unidentified flying object period it might not be an alien but it was an un it or it was and it remains unidentified now you want to talk about a conspiracy theory and i'm going really going into this people we have i because i went there i went there you can look up the documentary i watched that thing on netflix they have it on amazon they have some other lady who had a video on it or she made a movie about it documentary a lot of people saw this thing in in the sky and if you don't know about it it was in march hold on let me get those dates again okay march 13th of 1997 you have this triangle formation of lights form appear in the arizona phoenix arizona sky many people saw it many people went out and looked at it and reported called 911 said hey what is going on now and initially afterwards after there was that reporting we got they got reports from the military or somebody else saying oh that was a military um oh, what do you call those procedure or not nah, damn a military drill that they were having a drill that they had aircrafts in the sky that it was a drill but they but the people who saw it what they described wasn't like b1 bombers or eight fighters a10 fighters or, or, or anything in the sky moving in unit it was just these lights this big mass of things just hovering hovering over the city triangle lights like bam 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 because all going down one side and to the back i think it's just one side and i don't know if they were to the back side like a triangle but you had this like kind of arrow shape in the sky boom people rushed out and saw it so it's there and then you have all these people trying to do other things to refute everyone's claims that this was an alien vessel or this was an unidentified flying object there even the governor the governor came out and mocked it you know in a press conference where if you can go look this up on youtube you had the governor he came out and this um this guy had this he was like giving a press conference and then a guy came out in a suit like, oh, look, he's an alien. Ha ha ha. You guys are crazy. Uh, take yourself. Take yourself and go somewhere with this nonsense. Ha ha ha. And he made a little joke of it. And then, so basically these people, because these people were asking about it, they kept asking. And he so they mocked it and they made fun of it. However, later years down the line, he refuted. He he basically took back his rhetoric and said and told and told people and told reporters or someone that yes we did see something in the sky that day and they even referenced it in this movie this arizona movie where she tried to go uh the girl doing to uh, do it well no that was no no yeah yeah one of this girl this girl was the oh my goodness blair Witch was just the same damn movie okay okay i totally got those movies messed up whatever but the, this girl she was a sister and her brother was lost there yeah her brother was lost in arizona the you know she was among the teens lost that day so she comes back and she she went goes to the mayor house to try to like uh interview him as well but he doesn't want to talk blah 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 i don't even think that was him i think they just portrayal of him but yet it did happen that way where they have footage of him basically saying yes there was something in the sky that day you know and i don't know if he was i don't i don't can't remember if he said he was told to say that or to basically dispute that claim but most all signs point to conspiracy i'm just saying let's just add logic to logic it's all all the facts are there these are facts now is it real is it i i don't know but i like to entertain it because why it's interesting it adds meaning to life for me because like okay why don't, why can't we just question things why can't we question things without saying like oh no this is the truth it doesn't have to be the truth it's just entertaining the question and dispute <laughs> have fun with it come on people but okay again let's go back to if aliens did come back here what would be their reasoning okay we got this guy alan laverne oh, that was his middle name bean he was a american former naval officer and naval aviator, aviator, aeronautical engineer, test pilot, and NASA astronaut. He was the fourth person to walk on the moon. And he says, we call him the moonwalker. The moonwalker says he believes that aliens have visited the earth. 
He believes that if aliens have visited the earth, they would have brought them, brought with them solutions to many different problems we, the people of earth, suffer from currently, comma, like cancer. This is a quote from him. And so, and then I was reading, I was reading on in this article where about this Lee Spiegel guy of the Huffington Post who poo-poos on this idea uh, with this question, like, why would they bring us the cure for cancer? Okay, if you consider the universe and separation of dimensions by time and space, then there is a version of our species inhabiting one of the parallel planets in our galaxy far, in a galaxy far, far away. The species may not have already suffered as we are suffering. And yes, maybe they have answered all the questions we have not. Bean could have easily, this Alan Bean, Moonwalker, could have easily, he could have easily said that they bring with them, you know, a flying car. Because we're supposed to have a flying car by now. But a flying car isn't as practical as saying a cure to a disease that kills millions every year what if what if they did come here and they wanted to bring something what would they bring would they bring the cure if we go back to aliens prometheus which we like to do is reference movies so if we brought back aliens prometheus if they wanted to save the human race or if someone wants to save the, uh, the alien race they want to bring back our alien race which is like us from another planet but they come here and they're under disguise you know what's up what, what i'm putting what I'm saying is that this is a possibility that they that they're on Earth and that they are walking among among us. And that's just me talking on my butt. I'm trying to like if you love aliens, like you know, like if you love watching this stuff and like, entertaining those shows with your attention, that's it's just beautiful just to go into. You can really dwell into this crap. And like I said, don't go down the rabbit hole because you're gonna be like me sitting here in front of a microphone in a damn closet talking about aliens. However, what would they be? Some say that they have already been here, that they brought the technology technology that we use today. Think about it. Think about from the age of being Neanderthals or just the, the, the age of like the early Homo sapien. We didn't have any of this stuff. And look how we're growing. A lot of people suggest that, you know, alien crafts have come to the earth and that's where we're getting our technology. That would mean Apple somehow had a, had a man go to Roswell or had someone go to Roswell, break in, steal some of that technology. Kind of like the Transformers movie, you know, where we take it and we use it to our own advantage because you have to question the little computers in our hands sometimes. I know you can tell, go to binary binary numbers and say, look, this is because of one of the zeros and with that we can create this. Yes, but where did we get that? This stuff seems far too advanced for our little meager minds to wrap our heads around in my opinion so maybe we're just getting dumber or maybe we are getting smarter or maybe the computers are getting smarter again next episode blade runner i don't think the moonwalker was wrong why wouldn't they bring us a cure because we we all we always think that aliens will come to us and they would bring disease or death why not a cure for something why not something to help mankind why wouldn't they do that? Maybe because they don't understand us. And maybe the movies will be all right that, you know, if they ever came anywhere close, we'd probably just try to blow them out of the sky. Then it becomes what? Independence Day. See, if we have people visiting them, why don't we try to go visit them instead of them waiting for them to come to us? Maybe like dude said, they already been here. Maybe they don't want to come back because they seen it's like, uh, OK, unimpressed. I'm going to another parallel universe earth how about us going into outer space and start you know like a lot of these movies we're going into outer space we're doing the explore exploring we're becoming explorers again because there's only two other untapped there uh, things i think the amazon we 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 explore the amazon it's either explore the amazon or take it down which is totally inhumane if we do that because you know a lot of the earth's trees are still there and we need to start preserving trees keep the trees please but the depths the deep depth uh, deep dark depths depths of the earth within the sea you know under the sea we have not 
explored we cannot we you know a little bit but not to the extent to find you know whatever's lurking down there you know in the movie there could be a godzilla down there we don't freaking know because it's just so dang deep and we can't do anything we can't go down there without freaking killing ourselves that in space so now since we're talking about space if we wanted to explore or continue exploration which we have not whatever we we lost that sense of exploration you know that john f kennedy sense of exploration that that gumption to think that we can go out into outer space and achieve and put somebody on the moon and put somebody on mars we got a rover taking some good pictures but when is the next person going to go there when is the person going to go there go there because eh. oh think about um oh what's that one movie the martian good movie check that one out if you want to go see uh, you know what happens when we put a man on mars we know we know that for space travel to happen for humans you know let's think about this we destroy the earth which is happening we're slowly destroying the earth no matter what anyone says stuff ain't you know it's not looking right for us not looking good for future generations um probably lost some of you there let's focus on cryogenics please you know, let's get that Walt Disney type, you know, technology and to be able to freeze people and keep them living longer, you know, the free, their, freeze their bodies so we can send them light years away and have them wake up later to explore some of these, to explore some of these planets that we keep calling Earth 2 and Earth 3 and Earth A. This thing in this inhabitable over here. Hey, look, we found another possibly inhabitable planet inhabitable planet they keep saying these things right if you read these articles they say look at this planet we have this planet look it has water it has or it looks like earth but they <laughs> later on down the line it's like but it's ten thousand light years away it's like oh then how to why are you gonna tell us and get our hopes up if the damn planet's like ten thousand light years away tell me how we're gonna get there ten to get to 10,000 miles away. That's what I need to know. I want to know how we're going to do that. How are we going to achieve? Stop looking for these damn planets and start finding a way to get to one of these planets. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. I think I said that in another podcast. Wow. What the hell? Maybe that, why does that keep coming up? Maybe because I want to start preaching like that. I feel like I'm Malcolm X in that moment whatever let's start walk, working on the technology to get us to those planets because that has to be what's next cryogenics in all the movies i've seen you need cryogenesy to get you to somewhere else because of the space of time to send someone that far out because it's basically a do it's a die mission you have to have be able to have a facility a facility a space vessel that's that'll be able to sustain life that you can put people on, they can inhabit, they can live on this thing, travel, sleep for, you know, uh, light years, sleep for years within this cryogenic state, and then wake up when they're close to their destination. Now, let's not talk about the one movie that I hated, think that was 2016. It was the one with Jennifer Lawrence. Oh, what was that movie, though? Solar Life, whatever. Didn't like that movie either because it was ridiculous, but yet it's something like that where they froze like a whole community of people. Cryogenesis, that's what we need. We need that to move ourselves forward into the space exploration game. So where is the tech for this? I'm pretty sure somebody has to be working on the tech for this to keep our bodies asleep so that we can travel far distances, explore other planets. Has to be somewhere we need to know. Report back to me if you have an article on this. Because, you know, the suits just aren't enough. The suits are good. You know, but we just we currently, think about that. We currently, we don't have enough suits at the ready for any space travel and exploration. We've lost, we've, we've lost all spirit of adventure. Okay, space adventure. The guy from, you know, Virgin, you know, was bronze then. And Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, these cats, or anybody with money in this world, the all these people need to pull their resources together and screw the government by creating their own multi billion space travel and exploration program. They can be able to they can obtain the funds by promising the rich immortality, kind of like that passengers film 
The one I was talking about with Jennifer Lawrence. Even if they, the donors, are horrible people, we don't have to worry because those individuals are usually the first to die in colonization films because you know, some of them just don't know how to fit for themselves. So they get onto a planet, you leave them to their own resources so they can build a hut and house and stuff. Most likely they would die of some kind of disease or, you know, get eaten by something. And that's not to say all rich people are that way, but you know, the real privileged ones, the ones who would think that they, I will get on a planet of my own. They most likely would die because they would have to have people to serve them. And if those people don't want to serve them and they're on another planet, mutiny begins. And so then they die because, People just don't want to be servants. They don't want to be slaves. Just saying. But that is a possibility. <laughs> in my opinion. But that passage is movie was horrible too. They did have a cool scene in there that looked like that scene from, um, uh, I think it was a flashback to The Shining with the bar scene with the guy. Yeah. Okay. So my thing is also p- aliens wanted to come to Earth communication is the key and we saw this in a couple of movies that i've spoken about before that i want to speak about again because i watched the movies over again and i love them i'm talking about arrival and contact these all talking about the different the alternative ways in which aliens might visit us what if it's not just in physical form what if it's through verbal contact what if it's through language what if that's our gift that's what I want to know. So Arrival, this movie introduced us to the concept that language in itself is the best and most powerful element to any burgeoning or existing society to further its existence in the universe. However, this message was also conveyed quite heavily in the movie Contact three years prior to the publishing of the short story, uh, The Story of Your Life by that arrival was based on now Jodie Foster plays a scientist who discovers a signal emitting from out somewhere in the universe and it's her mission her objective and and the objective to her team to decode that meeting now if you compare the two stories language is the key to prosperity contact made a lot of biblical references i.e. the Ezekiel's will which will which takes us back to what I was talking about in um the Phoenix Forgotten movie. Very often we never really hear about the Ezekiel's will, but the Ezekiel's will was prevalent in this that movie towards the end and I'm spoiling it for you. But it's worth the lead up because it puts you on the, it had me on the edge of my seat. This Ezekiel Will shows up. And I say, you go into look up at that, you know, Ezekiel will. And it's like right there. And that's what sucks the person up. And it's like, it is so magnificent just to see it because it just wasn't a spaceship. It was actually an object and it was rotating around itself. It was beautiful. Well, I really like that. So we go back to, to those. And so she referenced that movie and that big old, that big structure that they were building in that, that was in Ezekiel's will. And that's what they were building to contact. That's what they had to build build to contact the the aliens because it was part of their scheme their diagram they gave that to us to communicate to them so once there's the uh i.e this is the ezekiel will the will the ezekiel's will once viewed by humans a thousand years ago the ezekiel's will the will was given to us as a gift of communication within this film the same with arrival and the language of the extra extraterrestrials a linguistic a linguistics specialist decides on taking a chance to really communicate with earth's visitors and stop the global catastrophe from happening which it means you know it's just acts of determination in this movie a string of predestined predestined okay a string of predestined Events occurs beyond anyone's control without a cause. There is no effect there. Therefore, we must act. Louise Banks witnessed the story of her unborn child, her daughter's life, and in knowing so, her future. She was emboldened to do right for the good of everyone without even changing that one thing that would cause her, without 
changing that one thing that would cause her joy, sadness, and pain. Now, Jodie Foster, so with that knowledge, with the knowledge that she was given, she was given sight into the future. She could have changed something, and she chose to change the earth. She knew what it would bring. She knew that the future would bring, bring pain, but she had that in that decision, in that moment to make a decision like these aliens are giving me a look into the future. And so in that scene, the heartbreak, the joy, the happiness her daughter would bring her. She also had to basically save the world from itself because it was all a matter of communication. The movie put it a little differently than the book, but it's like on the cusp of something. If we don't talk, only the worst could happen, right? Like if we don't speak to one another, only the worst could happen. One person makes in this um in this idea where they thought that okay, alien vessel looks like I said before, <laughs> alien vessel comes to Earth most likely, or it's anywhere in sight. Most likely, we'll try to blow it out of the sky. I just read an article about Japanese, uh, the Japanese scientists want to aim a laser up into the sky to break an an uh, asteroid that might be hurt- hurtling towards Earth or near Earth. Like, why would you want to break that into more pieces? Because then it's just going to go spread out more upon the earth and then wreck even more harmful destruction upon many other places and locations. I'm just saying. But it's things like that. It's just our, our impetual nature to just go in and just, and just shoot something. <laughs> it's just like, huh, that thing right there looks rather ominous. So let's just shoot it out the sky. Yeah. Sounds like bop, bop, beep. <laughs> it just blows up everything whatever but communication so i like this movie i like these two movies because that's what they that's another way to look at aliens well back in the 1960s 60s and 30s it's just based on the fear thereof they weren't exactly the aliens were exactly here in those movies to welcome us you know they weren't here to come to or like war of the world they come here to cultivate they come here to seek life or to seek energy some kind of energy source or food and we become the victims and so we have to ultimately defend ourselves right but in these two movies which took another look at it they that wasn't the case it was all about language and communication with one another contact was a little bit went a little bit off scale but arrival maintained that sensibility that okay we must talk to our neighbors if they do yeah, if they so happen to come around, let's not try to shoot them out of the sky. So Jodie Foster in her in, in the movie Contact, she lost her father when she was young. As a result, her character became obsessed with space time travel, you know, space travel and what's beyond the stars. If aliens wanted to make contacts with humans, would you suppose they already have? I asked that question again. Sure. However, just maybe it wasn't us in Homo sapien form. And I think it's like stories like that that really help further along the discussion of alien life as an entertaining thought. It doesn't necessarily have to be what they will do when they come here, what they look like. Do they look like space aliens? It's like, what will they bring to us? Will they bring the knowledge? Will they bring what Moonwalker says, uh, possibly says? Will they bring like a cure to our diseases? Will they bring more technology? Will they bring war? And although it might not be feasible, it might not be something that you want to talk about. Uh, eh, that seems a little bit too off cuffed for me, so I don't want to talk about this. But it is something that you could open up a discussion about. It's never here or there. And I recently, um, I was talking to a friend where we were talking at work. And one of the things he said, because he's, he's of a certain religion and he believes certain things. And so sometimes some of the things out of his mouth are kind of like i just like hmm, i cringe and i think about like really you really think that and i don't want to question someone's religion because that's what that's their religion i don't really care what they believe in as long as they believe in something that's fine i don't have to believe in what you believe in that's that's it he said what if the aliens what if aliens the dinosaurs are aliens I'm like that's a fair thought that's a fair thought because these creatures existed thousands and thousands millions of years ago so if you think about that as well Okay, aliens are already here. <laughs> aliens are dead. Or maybe we are or maybe we are the aliens. Maybe the human race are the aliens. Maybe we weren't even supposed to be here. Have you ever thought about that? Or maybe we're just in a simulation. Simulation. That's another thing. 
but that's in, that's when you're dealing with computers. So there's all kinds of little aspects to open up a cool conversation with someone that you love or like that you really want that that, that that you not really I guess love, but something somebody that you like to carry on these conversations with. And when you think about space, think about what could they bring to us instead of hey, how are they gonna kill us? What could they bring to us? What benefit could an alien visiting the Earth bring to us? Maybe they will bring to us information, coordinates to the next planet to inhabit when our goes to shit, that handbasket. You just never know. So we just like open our minds, start communicating, and watch the movie Arrival and Contact. You can watch Passengers just for that one aspect because they did have a pretty kind of cool colony thing where they had the colony on the ship. This next movie I'm going to talk about in my this, that, and other news. The next movie I'm going to going to discuss is in relation to that. Setting, setting up a colony in a different space. Setting up a colony on a ship and transforming a colony of people on a ship and cryogenics. All that comes into life in this one 2017 movie that was alien-like but wasn't aliens. But they really wanted to be like aliens. Okay, this is another news. I want to bring to light another movie that I saw in 2017 that talks about aliens in a different way. Uh, I'm not saying this is the most ridiculous movie of 2017 or a horror movie of 2017, but it was kind of a little silly. Think about this. It was Life with Jake Gyllenhaal and Ryan Reynolds and some other people. Recently, in the 17th or somewhere around the mid-December area, you know, NASA or scientists, even our scientists out in Arizona, these scientists here, they noticed, no, Honolulu, I think it was. Honolulu is a massive asteroid, this massive figure just sitting out there floating out in space. It appears out of basically nowhere. They did not detect it. It was just kind of like, oh, okay, wait, look, um, hey, Bob, you look at look at the monitor. Yeah, what you, what you got there? Oh, golly, golly gracious. What the hell is that? That is um a big ass rock or something. But the thing about this rock is that it was not like a massive form like they usually see an asteroid forms like, you know, usually like a big boulder or something like it just just looks like a big rock. If you pick up a rock off the uh a, a stagnant you know, rock and it just has all these little craters and stuff on it. That's usually what their meteors look like. But this one's kind of flat, you know, and it had a different, it had a different shape to it, oblong shape to it. And so that really posed people to think a little, like to question what was this thing and where did it come from? If anything, if it was barreling toward us and it came out of nowhere, we were goners because this thing was massive and it's kind of just floated it kind of just missed us, you know, it didn't like it wasn't heading toward us. It just kind of, OK, it took another a by angle. <laughs> it just went bam off into another uh, off away from us, past us and not towards us. So it's kind of weird. I forgot the name. It says in the Hawaiian name and I don't want to say it because I do not want to embarrass people uh, with saying the name of this um, asteroid. But you can look it up is. It's happened around December and stuff. And so in a, a few days later, they started thinking about, okay, they start searching it, like really trying to use the, uh, the, the, the satellites or, no, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, they're not, they're telescopes to really hone in on the object because they wanted to search it for what organic life, life, because it looked so different from anything else they've seen before, right? So that leads me, led me into thinking like, oh, snap, I just saw a movie like this. And I just like the movie I was mentioning, Life, where they sent, they had something like this happen where they were exploring a rock. And so this rock, this thing that they were exploring, exploring they finally, they finally, they, they get a sample of it. They bring it on board. They find organic life. But then this organic thing starts forming on the ship within their a scientific tube or something like that, a space, uh, a glass container, a compartment, and they have it there, and this thing, and it grows, and then it grows, and it continues to grow, cell manipulation, manipulation. So it turns out that this dormant cell, this dormant thing that they, this organic, organic matter that they don't have, they bring it to life because they want it. They want to see this life. They want proof. That's what they came here for proof of organic life out in space 
So then it happens. Boom. They bring it back. They bring it to life. Then it just wreaks holy havoc. And I think the the next, so I can only explain the rest of this movie as saying aliens. Just watch aliens. Like alien, the first one. Just watch that. That's kind of what happened. Thing gets on the ship, wreaks havoc, start killing everybody. And Ryan Reynolds, first to go. So if you, no. Yeah, Ryan Reynolds, first to go. So if you came there to watch Ryan Reynolds, they put him on the poster. He's dead. He's dead in the first, like, you know, 30 minutes. So, sorry. I'm ruining that for you. If you're a Ryan Reynolds fan, watch a different movie. That really just intrigued me. I'm thinking, oh, this big old rock over there. And I just saw this movie, like, months ago. Like, oh, it's not they're going to pull off organic matter from that thing. They're going to send something up there to get it. But then it kind of, like, went away before we could, like, really do anything to mess with it, <laughs> to toy with it. Because, you know, us, we scientists, you know, we have to. But yet, maybe that would get us out in space. But we do have people out on, you know, space you know the, the, the space stations out there so it's possible they could have rolled over there and checked it out but i'm just saying sometimes you got to be careful what you wish for because sometimes these these movie things they come true you know uh it's my it's my idea that all these stories they're not really just stories they they either happening now or they, oh no, not, that's another answer. i'll tell i'll go i'll go into that now stories aren't just stories to me so they could be premonitions if you think about yeah adam you hear you you hear me premonitions is the thing we were talking about yeah if you listen um yeah so if you think about that they had that thing it's happened in december uh 2017 just look up asteroid misses earth crazy so and in another alien news this 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 the point this this disappoints me though Back in the day, uh, previous episode, talking with Fritos, I reported on this thing called the Tabby Star. And the Tabby Star is basically this radio emission. They had this telescope focused on this one part of space, and it was sending back this this light, the sun. They had it focused on the sun, and something was blocking the sun, sending back intermittent signals. It looked like signals, like flashes, like boom, boom, boom. Something was blocking the sun. So they thought, scientists thought it was a med- mega structure blocking the star. And they said if this thing was that big, then most likely it had to be either a spaceship or a big ass rock. And if that big ass rock was coming anywhere near Earth, we were all gone, right? This tabby mega structure. They think it's a mega, mega structure. For three years now, they've just been looking at this thing, like trying to break it apart. What is it? What signal is uh, sending this signal? They were thinking that if it's alien, if it's this structure, if it's alien, it's blocking, you know, it, something could be trying to say, send us a signal, you know, because this may be boom, boom. It's maybe rotating, maybe rotating or something. And so it's blocking the earth, blocking the sun, opening up, blocking the sun, blocking the sun. So it's something blocking this thing. Um, but, Okay, and lo and behold, it turned out it's just a damn dust storm. It's like a dust storm, and so dust storm passes into it. It's like an ongoing, like maybe orbital dust storm. It comes around like they do on Mars, like they see on Mars or something, but it's out there in the atmosphere, out there in space. And so if it's circular around, orbiting, 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 then you have all these little pieces, you know, these rocks and everything else, space dust, whatever, it's blocking out the star and so it makes it seem like it's dimming and that it was that dimming that really alerted them because they never seen anything like that before because either something was blocking it or there was a signal being emitted from somewhere out in space that they picked up so that kind of ruined the illusion this year early i think that was like early 2017 uh, 2018 so i learned that kind of disappointed because it's kind of cool like i said it's cool just to think about it shit might not be real nothing might not be coming of it but it's cool to explore the idea and that's why you see these scientists these are these aren't people these aren't me these aren't like just regular folks these are actually real smart people me i'm a dumbass i'm dummy these people are smart and they believed it and they uh, they had this thing had them believe in that wow we've discovered something it could be alien it could be awesome Again, it was cool to follow that story, you know, for three years now, for two to three years now, it's been in the news coming here and there. They were, they would report on it and tell you things and update you. And it's like, oh, maybe it was this, maybe it's this. And I think it went on long enough where people start thinking it was a, yeah. And then they thought it was like this thing called a Dyson sphere. And what it is, it's like, it's supposed to be this mega structure that completely engulfs a star 
and captures most or like all of his light in the sense that it would curve the light in a certain way that would just make it very unnormal. It was not normal to have light curve in a certain way. As time went on, as it did, and I start following, they thought it was this Dyson sphere thing. It's like this thing that just covers the the sun and just revolves around it. And so then that's where you get your intermittent, intermittent shadows of light, curved light. The lights were curved. So I'm thinking you just, you know, leave yourself up to some belief on some things. Have some fun with the news. Don't just read the regular crap because news is boring. Listen to this, that, and other news. Talking with burritos. Come here. Join us. We'll do that again. Also, I'm saving the best for last, y'all. Actually, I got two more things. Got two more things I want to talk about. Now, this is going back to, I'm going to bring this all together right now. This is going back to 2000, I mean, to the Phoenix Lights story and Phoenix Forgotten. Now, Phoenix Lights, Kurt Russell, our Kurt Russell, you know, the Escape from New York guy, you know. Freaking Kurt Russell, bomb ass Kurt Russell. He says that he saw it as well. Yup, I'm telling you, this is actually from this man's mouth. I saw the interview it was on YouTube. He said it. He said that he was piloting a plane near Phoenix and witnessed the phenomenon himself. Now, why would Kurt Russell come out and say some BS like that if it's just BS? I'm telling you, people, there's a lot surrounding this whole Phoenix Star stuff that we need to, you know, maybe not investigate. But I think that, you know, you watch the movie. Uh, I, I, it would lend to you watching the movie. The, some of the other bio, the other stories of some of the other like biographical stories was kind of like, were kind of boring documentaries. They're kind of like blah. But you know add some interesting facts to this it's like kurt russell just came out of nowhere this year and this thing happened back in 1997 he came out and said yeah i saw those things i was piloting a plane around there but i don't know why he didn't say anything then but who are we to not believe him now shoot i believe him that's kurt russell snake pliskin and this is talking with burritos and that's a wrap but not a burrito Okay, I came up with this cool visual art for this title I came up with for this uh, episode. It was called uh, Free Fire Aliens and the Phoenix Guy. And so I did this cool cover art for the podcast and for the episode. And I just put that title in there. But I was like, I do not want to talk about Free Fire. (laughs) But I want to talk about it because it's in the title. And I want to give you something that relates that to the content within this episode. So this is a brief interview, a, a brief review of that movie, Free Fire, that was this year directed by Ben Wheatley. So let's get into this. Okay, when you bring, oh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do this. I'm kind of like scripting. I had some stuff scripted, scripted for this. So when you bring guns into any business deal and tempers flare, someone will get shot in the face or leg or arm or wait. We still need that character, so don't write them out just now, just yet. Just keep them around a little bit longer with some exposition. Now, Ben Ben Wheatley's 1970s um, Arm Still Gone Wrong film, Free Fire, you know, loses, it lost its temperament as its main characters became less intriguing and the whodunit plot became more like a who done did it or who done did them wrong scenario. As entertaining as the movie was, the claustrophobic rampage of violence falls short of the greedy grindhouse films i thought it would emulate either give it more grit or more story free fire is like that happy medium it pleases and disappoint but never truly fails to captivate with such a great setup and foresight into hilarious events that happen the night before the big deal goes bad we're teased by the idea that at least a few of these miscreants have storylines worth a bit more fleshing out. Now, unfortunately, that's when you enter into Tarantino land and invite comparisons to expositional play out. Wheatley would have loved to have have avoided, but, you know, the comparison was already there. The trailer alone had people biting at the bit for something Tarantino-like, which, to his chagrin, wasn't the most desirable comparison to be had 
and proved not to, you know, have a real effect on ticket sales. So to be Tarantino light, he just had to. I, uh, I know he, he probably wanted to avoid the comparison to do so. They have interesting characters in this movie. I'm telling you, if you guys have a chance, go and rent this movie because it, it was at least fun. You will see the, the possibility there for more. And think about in comparison this movie to like hateful eight where is this is closed in scenario but you learned almost everything about these characters within this movie just based through you know verbal exposition which is carrot tarantino's you know it's true wheelhouse this is what he does but to be able to do this with this movie would have been very would have bought more brought more importance to the characters and the role they play within this saga within this uh uh, th- within this this scenario where this arms deal goes wrong and then everybody's shooting at each other you know because right now because as everyone starts shooting it's like okay what's what's the important who who cares who wins <laughs> you know it's like okay they're just you're just watching a gunfight at this thing and it goes on a little bit too long we don't know who's shooting at who and why and i guess that's supposed to be the intrigue but it kind of just left me kind of boring. Like, okay, just kill somebody already and kill that guy. Why keep him alive? Just kill him already. And that's just, that's, that's what threw me up. But to be Tarantino like, I don't think it was already being compared. So I don't think he had to maybe uh, go in a little lower in his expectations for this film script wise and maybe cut a lot of dialogue out that maybe they thought would be in comparison to Tarantino like. I think keeping those aspect in, aspects in, if they did exist, would have been beneficial to the actual plot and the overall payoff in the end with the gun shootout and everyone dying. So the great thing about this closed-in plot, though, is the development of the characters involved, getting to know what makes them tick. Why are they in this place? What possible incentives will they get out of this situation? And knowing a little bit of history into their motives as suspense leading up to the big reveal so what i enjoyed about free fire was what happened off the screen the night before the group of domestic arm dealers gathered into this warehouse one person one of the persons involved involved hit on the other guy's cousin cousin and when she rejected him he smashed her face in with a bottle this was a genius setup to an awesome plot however once the guns came out and everybody Everyone began shooting and hollering. The subplot goes all goes all to shit. Yeah, they have their little playoff at the end, those two characters. But I was kind of lost at that at the end of that. I just wanted them. I really did. I just wanted that plot because having that play out was just interesting. You're like, oh, you hit on my cousin. You smash. She said no to you, so you smash her face in with a bottle. That's awesome. You know, I would like to see more of that. You know, those little side pieces, those characters, and then one of them. He he brings it in, and then he is actually one of those kids that was involved in that brawl. Is the his uncle brought him along on the arms deal, so they had this dynamic there, but that just was never really truly explored. That I wish there was like a part two, but everybody's dead, so you can't really do a part two. But you could do a prequel. So it was. <laughs> I would like to just say, you know, it was Mr. Orange all along. Mr. Orange got shot early in Reservoir Dogs and spent the entire movie bleeding while everyone else mucked around, suspecting and killing one another. In this movie, the big reveal, oh look, it was that person, played out more calmly than the stage presented. I felt nothing for any of the players involved and solemnly walked away from this film wondering how cool it would have been if I knew just a little bit more about Justin Vernon chris and the cool black guy that looks like bernie mac i'm sure they had more interesting backstories than this movie had bullet thank you for listening again go download that movie go watch free fire tell me what you think was it tarantino like was it less tarantino like was it just about tarantino medium i don't know you tell me what you like talking with com. visit this podcast episode for any of the, of the links to the stargazing stories that i have in here about the tabby star or about the gigantic life rock and kurt russell seeing the phoenix likes thanks for, for listening and um uh, we'll see you next time blade runner ha <laughs> ha go get that movie